Change just like. Oh, okay. We're recording. Thank you. Forgot to do that before. Um, so the one on the left that's oxidized, it completely changed the color of it. And um, it's just really interesting to see the ways that also resin as like a chemical material can change um, natural materials. And it also is just um, an example of how toxic and uh, kind of destructive it is um, in a nutshell. Uh, so here's some avocado pits. This is on the right incorporated into a kind of gypsum polymer material called aqua resin. Um, and then on the left is like handmade paper with avocado pit, uh, which gives us really beautiful, like kind of pink, um, red, brown color. And- uh, Do you pulverize the pits? Yes. So, we, well, you don't actually have to pulverize them. Um, if you just take, like, once you eat an avocado um, and you have, like, the avocado shell and the pits left over, you can just um, throw it into a pot and boil water. And um, after, like, maybe an hour or so, you'll get this kind of uh, rich, like, pink color. And um, with that, you can kind of, like, uh, cook it down so it's, like, a little bit thicker. Um, or you can also, this is how they dye textile, so you can um, just put, like, cotton clothing in there or something you want to dye. It's it's so exciting all the ways you can apply color to things. Um, but it is a little bit different with natural colors because it does fade over time. Um, but yeah, you, you could pulverize it if you wanted to, but then it would be kind of, uh, it's best if it's like kind of in one solid piece so it doesn't get everywhere with the material you pull out. Um, and so this is some of the, uh, Biomaterials I was combining with algae-based pigments and um, blue is a very rare color to find naturally. We find it in um, like minerals and it's also found in butterfly pea flower, but this blue is really vibrant and I was really excited to find it because um, it comes from spirulina algae. And these are some photos of like large scale spirulina algae farms. And some of you may be uh, familiar with algae, spirulina algae, it is um, very high in protein, antioxidants. It's used in like smoothie bowls and um, industrially it is filtered until it becomes this kind of like velvety texture. And then it, you can buy it um, as like that kind of velvety material or it's usually uh, in like this solid form. And um, also I taught a class on how to like grow algae, how to extract pigment and how to dye it with the pigment, which was really exciting because um, as an artist learning about the actual process to get from this raw source to a commercial like material was really interesting um, because I deal with uh, that somewhat in my actual developing of materials. And um, it also has taught me a lot about um, just how much of a material we need to make a portion of this other material we extract from it. So. Um, to get that actual blue pigment um, that I was showing before, you would have to grow 400 liters of algae to actually wow. uh, yield yeah, 40 grams of dried spirulina, which would then uh, only give you four grams of dried pigment. So we need a lot of this base material. And um, in those extraction processes, every time there's waste from uh, something that you take out, there's a whole other way you could use that, which has been really interesting to me. Um, wow. So specifically where we find um, this blue pigment in spirulina, in spirulina they're kind of like these little spiral shaped uh, uh, strands of algae and they're made up of these little cells uh, which have these thylakoid um, areas in them that are kind of like where the actual energy is created in the uh, algae cell. And so there are these little um, protein complex flowers that are embedded in those uh, thylakoid membranes and in the petal part of that flower, um, we get these accessory pigments. <clears throat> and it's really exciting because we find blue in, um, which is called, the, the protein complex is called phycocyanin. Um, we get that in spirulina algae, but you can also find phycoerythrin, which is another uh, protein complex that gives you a red pigment. Uh, we can get that from other types of algae. So with um, genetic engineering, uh, there have, there's been a lot of um, push for finding new ways to kind of grow 
pigments from algae because there is a whole, an entire rainbow of pigments you can actually find from algae. And so this is my um, extraction process that I was teaching people in the class I did online. This was in um, January. Uh, so we were taking, we sent people kits and um, we took just like a powdered spirulina. Um, we added material to kind of burst open the cells and we filtered that. And you can see once the cells are just burst open in this first filtration, um, it starts to turn blue and it separates that pigment out of the actual cell. And then um, we do another filtration. We find um, a material to the pigment and then pull it out. And you're left with this like incredibly bright blue pigment at the end, but not a ton of it, just enough that you can, it's kind of like a proof of concept. Um, and just from kind of experimenting with this pigment, I've been able to extract different colors from the entire extraction process and also through changing the color, the final blue color with pH, um, just adding soap to it, I was able to turn it purple. Um, so there's been so much like serendipitous discovery in working with these materials. And also um, this is on the right, I incorporated just like some of the pigment with water into the glass pieces that I was making and it will fluoresce red in UV light or in sunlight, which is really incredible to see. Um, and I've also been incorporating it into paints, um, into like some of my sculptures, and it's also used for textiles. Um, and the process is a little bit different from other uh, dyeing techniques. We use like a microwave and then like a freezer um, to get the protein to bind to the textile and then to kind of stop it from further, uh, because basically heat will kind of um, unravel the protein. So we have to like freeze it right away. But it has been just so cool and so exciting to learn about all of this. Um, and even though I haven't found anything yet still that resembles resin at all, um, I, I've still been driven by this kind of concept of how do I find a natural source of a clear material because it is very rare. And I've been thinking about it for a long time, like where do we actually see clearness and it's usually in like marine based sources. Um, and I ended up working with uh, chitosan, which is a the second most abundant biopolymer after um, cellulose and we find it in crustacean shells insects mushrooms in some algae and uh, it is really versatile it is very um, easy to work with and it is also it comes from waste streams because we can take like seafood shells crustacean shells uh, shrimp shells um, basically pulverize it and then um, through there's like you can ferment it or extract it with um, like acids and bases and we get this other material so it starts out as a non it's basically water resistant but through that extraction process it is made to be water soluble so it's readily usable and so I literally take this powder I dissolve it in vinegar and I get this really thick viscous solution that I then pour into um, here's I'm gonna go two slides over um, so here's I usually get it commercially um, it can be in a flake form in a powder or pre-made solution and I will pour it into um, petri dish and dehydrate it or just let the uh, water contents evaporate over the course of like a week and um, I go from there and this is okay so I'm gonna back up a little bit I I am really lucky. I was able to do um, a fellowship with the lab at Caltech last summer because I had to develop this clear uh, non-toxic alternative to resin. And I felt like I was unable to kind of continue developing it from where I was. And I found a lab that supported the work I was doing. But because of COVID, I wasn't able to go into the actual lab. And I ended up working with uh, that lab and it's uh, Julie Cornfield. Uh, is the the lab that if you want to look it up, um, she's amazing. Helped me develop ways to characterize the materials that I was making in my studio. So this was kind of my studio in LA. I had began uh, working with all these instruments to better understand the materials I was making and how they compared to resin. So um, 
these are from some of the presentation slides I did for that uh, fellowship. And um, the lab that I was working with was a rheology lab. So they studied like the flow of matter. Um, and that was really strange for me because I only knew so much about the actual solid material. And um, the first thing we were looking at was the viscosity of the materials because um, in like polymer theory, the viscosity will correlate to the actual tensile strength of the material. Um, because if the uh, polymer chains are longer, there's they're going to entangle more and they will kind of, in, uh, they will be able to undergo more stress and um, tension because they'll like kind of grab onto each other a little bit like Velcro. Um, and so I also had to find a way to measure the viscosity, um, which is much harder than you would think. I went through multiple uh, mechanisms to do this. This this also happened over the course of 10 weeks. And I, I didn't quite finish um, with this part because it was so complex. Um, but I learned a lot about like fluid mechanics because what we were doing, we were basically just taking um, a teeny tiny ball and dropping it through a column of the solution and counting how long it took for that ball to drop. Um, and then we were then going from there to make a chart of that and looking at um, the trends in that chart. And I found a way to make this happen on a smaller scale so that I was able to use less material and kind of usually if I was doing it on a larger scale, I would have to do like um, a test and like either pour out the material or do another one. And this was much more sustainable. So uh, it was exciting for me to kind of take my interest in sustainability and art and apply it to the actual work I was doing with the lab. And we were also looking at the optical properties of the final films that I was making. So um, what I was looking at specifically was how does the actual optical uh, properties, the viscosity, the tensile strength differ from different manufacturers uh, of chitosan. And as I mentioned before, they were all the same. I would dissolve it in vinegar and then um, take that solution and pour it. And despite using the same process, I was getting these really different uh, just like pro properties in the actual film. So this one, it was like really blurry in the background. Um, this one on the bottom, it was much more sharp, but it was still distorted. And so um, we were using just like, I made a, a light box with an Amazon box and I put lights in it then put kind of um, white sheet of plexiglass on top and was taking photos from above it with um, a piece of black tape behind the samples. And you can see how much um, the light is distorted behind the samples. Like there's a huge range and they're all the same concentration just from different sources of chitosan, so different crustaceans and um, also different ways that they were actually uh, processed, which I can only know so much about from the manufacturer. So these tests were also kind of to make sure that the manufacturer was telling me um, something about the material, if it was actually true. And we were using um, some coding to figure out how the light was uh, changing throughout the samples. Um, and then we were also using a kind of push pull machine to test the tensile strength of the samples. Um, and this, this is like a summary of the work that I was doing, um, but it was really, really compelling and really different, a different way of thinking to take my observations and to make uh, quantitative analyses of them. Um, and it kind of has been feeding into the work I've been doing recently. Um, and at, towards the end of this, I was also trying to find a way to make uh, a stronger material because the films were so thin. I wasn't able to get them thicker than um, like an eighth of an inch at most. So I was thinking about composites, which I was familiar with from sculpting, um, which are essentially just a matrix and reinforcement, which creates an even stronger material than one of than just either of those two materials alone. And um, composites are usually very light, super strong. They're what has allowed us to have aircraft, our cars, um, everything that we know that is like really sturdy and light. And so this was I was using uh, fiberglass and resin to make this sculpture and it was a really nasty process of like taking um, these sheets of just like teeny tiny thin um, kind of fibers that are literally, literally from glass which um, are known to kind of if you inhale 
these pieces of glass, it will like break, it will scar your lungs. Um, it's essentially just like taking little razor blades and slicing your lungs up and they never go away. So it's not great to work with this and it's used on boats um, and surfboards. Yeah, <laughs> A lot of things that we interact with, it's um, really toxic, but it's, it's a great material. So I was interested in bio-based fibers and I found um, that hagfish are a source of these fibers and they're fished um, because they're eaten in Korea and that fishing process um, creates an excess of the slime which contains the fibers. And this is what the, the fibers look like when they're dried. Um, so hagfish will uh, excrete these fibers as a def defense mechanism. So a predator will come and bite the hagfish and it will excrete the slime really rapidly. And the slime is so thick and gooey that it will suffocate the predator um, and they aren't able to kill the hagfish. So hagfish have also been around for a really long time. Um, they are one of the, they're a living fossil. They're only, um, one of the only remaining animals from um, the period that they lived. We, the oldest known fossil is like 300 million years old. So they're, there's been some things that say that they're older than horseshoe crabs, but I think that they're maybe a little bit younger, but they, they are invertebrates. They're, their spinal column is um, cartilage, but they are also jawless. And their most, the closest relation is to lampreys. So this is, you can see that I have to pinch the hagfish to actually extract the slime. And the slime is like wow. this really magical, incredible right. material. It's like liquid water. Um, it's really wild to hold, but it was um, really hard to do this because I, I don't like stressing out hagfish. Um, and I, I had incentive to do this because I was like, oh, this works really well. These are some of the casts I had of Kaidazan um, with the hagfish slime fibers that were dried, um, cast into them. And I ended up getting um, hagfish in my studio. This is uh, a tank, you can't see them, but they're in here. This is a tank that I, I got. Um, the hagfisherman gave me hagfish and um, the tank was, blacked out, all the windows uh, were darkened because hagfish are a deep sea eel essentially. And I had to get a chiller. I didn't know anything about aquariums, but I, um, I, oh yeah, my mom, I'll talk about where I went to get the hagfish, yes. Um, it was it was a whole other world that I had entered. And um, I, I found hagfish also through listening to a podcast about hagfish. And it turns out that there was a lab in LA um, that works with hagfish. I reached out to them and they introduced me to the hag fisherman who was in uh, Monterey. And um, so I had to go up to Monterey to get the slime. And I ended up driving uh, back five hours with a cooler full of hagfish in my trunk, trying to figure out where to get uh, an aquarium and a chiller. <laughs> wow. It was an adventure. And um, I, I ended up falling in love with my hagfish. Uh, this is Priscilla on the right, um, to the point that I <laughs> I wasn't unable to slime them because I felt so bad oh, no. having to stress them out. Uh, but they were, they are so fascinating because they are like, so they've been around for so long. They've been very successful in staying around for a long time because of their slime. And they're the only uh, sliming uh, sea creature that with like, that contains, their slime contains fibers that we know of. Is there something you wanted to say? No, okay. Um, <laughs> um, and over the course of six months, I was trying to maintain the water levels um, in the tank and I had to change the water out every week. And I would also have to like kind of, there's all these tubes I would like put these droplets into color and try to figure out how much ammonium or nitrate, nitrite was in the tank and what I needed to add to it. I had this aquarium guy on speed dial. Um, it was crazy. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> sadly, um, Priscilla died after six months and I was, I was devastated. And um, a second one died a few weeks after. And how long do they usually live? What's a normal? So they can they can live up to forty years, but um, they only live up to seventeen years in captivity. 
We also don't know how they reproduce. They're very mysterious. Um, and so, yeah, it was, it was really sad to see how short they live, but also there's no how to care for hagfish book that exists. <laughs> there's like um, scientific papers and scientific uh, kind of observational books on them, but they, nothing is really like, here's what to do when this happens. Um, so I, I kind of just had to ask who people that knew about fish in general, but hagfish are very unique. So anyway, um, I couldn't, there, I had one last hagfish that I couldn't bear to see die. I ended up releasing this hagfish back into the ocean because I couldn't figure out how to take care of it. Um, and I didn't want it to die in my tank if I could uh, help it. So I released it back into the harbor in um, San Pedro in California. Um, and I hope that that hagfish is still around. Um, and it was really, this was the first time that I had been caring for the source of my actual material that I was working with. And so it was really devastating and emotional to go through this, but also as an artist, I wanted to kind of like understand what had just happened. And um, the best way I knew to do that uh, was to kind of work with what was left over. And so also to kind of understand what had happened to them, why did they die? And I was reading about how they often get these like inner lesions. So I ended up dissecting one of my hagfish and its skin just like, their skin is like not really attached to them. So it kind of just came off right away. Um, and it was really beautiful. And you can see actually all of these little dots that are up along uh, the body on the, this is the skin is inside out in the left image. Those are all slime glands. So every time they slime, it's coming from like those little cocoons that are inside of those little dots. I told you this, but I was, my, my mom was like, wow, I've told her this before, but it's like, until you see this photo, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, it was just being able to like care for them and also um, learning more about their body has just taught me so much about their relationship to me and the environment and the material that comes out of them. Um, so I ended up also tanning their skin because I had recipes on tanning fish skin. Um, and all I used was egg yolk and olive oil. Um, and overnight it turned into this like transparent film that was incredible. And it's actually in my installation right now. Um, there's like a fan that's droning back and forth with the hagfish skin on the end. Um, and then with some of the other hagfish with Priscilla, I made a lot of casts of her. And um, I have just been really interested in the cat. People think that uh, when they see the cast, some people think that they're pieces of bread for some reason <laughs> from far away or other people think they're like pretzels. Um, but it, it's funny because actually they curl up when they're happy and they do have an affinity to curl like left or right. Um, but yeah, just having like a kind of replica of their body to hold is kind of like a way of respecting them, but also thinking about how we we tend to kind of embalm bodies and like the ways that we want this thing to outlive us. Um, like I often do with my pieces that are cast in resin. So it has been a very strange and interesting and insightful grieving process that I've been going through since losing Priscilla. Um, and that also has led me to working with cicadas um, because I, I was really excited that uh, Brew 10 was happening and that the periodical cicadas were coming back. And I remembered how many, that there was just this wealth of shells that were left over um, from when I was younger. And um, I had been researching chitosan so much that I knew uh, from reading about it that their shells were also made of chitosan. So um, these are some photos from a few months ago um, from when the cicadas came. So you can see on the left, there's all the cicadas in the trees. Uh, and the, here's one molting. And um, this is the third image uh, on the top is all the shells on the ground that I was finding. Like there's just so many shells. And um, so I invited people to collect shells and um, I hosted a workshop uh, with the shed space, which is um, a gallery space in a friend's backyard in Baltimore. and. Um, 
these are some photos from the workshop. We took uh, the shells and we ground them up and I had to find um, a kind of mostly safe uh, extraction process to make the shells. And um, I also wanted to do this because this was like the closest thing I could kind of show people that they also were familiar with um, to kind of talk about material extraction, the ethics of that, um, and to also think about what do we actually know about where these shells come from? Like, how does that affect the environment when we take these shells away? Like, we may think that they're empty and that they are no longer needed, but we don't actually know that. So um, I wanted people to kind of see that process and to experience the material hands-on to begin thinking about these things. And also through just collecting the shells in itself, you learn so much about um, just like how the cicadas molt and like you see so just like some of them that are stuck and you wonder like what happened and um, there's just so many anomalies that we just like overlook because we aren't looking close enough so this workshop was really exciting and I was really glad that I was able to share it with people um, it is the extraction process is not complete right now it is um, much more complex than just doing it during a one hour workshop. So this is essentially um, what I was telling people. So you take the cicada shells, you grind them up um, and you have to put it through a very acidic bath, a hydrochloric acid bath um, to remove the minerals from the shell. So like there's a lot of calcium in them and then you have to filter it and neutralize it. Um, and then you wanna remove the proteins. So you then put it in a very alkaline bath with sodium hydroxide, filter it, neutralize it. And then um, to remove the color, it's bleached. Um, and then it also undergoes, and at this point, it's what I was talking about before, it's chitin, so it's still, it's water resistant. Um, and then it has to undergo another um, alkaline bath for it to become um, a water soluble material. And the water soluble material is chitazan. Uh, and that's the, the powder form that I usually just buy commercially. But it was exciting because there's the potential that we could make it ourselves from cicada shells. But at the same time, we can see the start and end to when their shells exist. And we can also think about how does that kind of timeline uh, relate to these larger timelines of materials that we extract because we don't always see or understand or know when that end of that resource is going to occur. Um, and that can also just better inform the ways that we practice mining and extraction and how we understand those processes to exist and also who bears like the brunt of the pollution that comes from those processes. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, here's just another kind of overview of how I make Kaidazan. Um, and if anyone is interested in making it yourself, I'm more than happy to share this with you. And you can always ask me more questions if this isn't specific enough. Um, and so again, just taking the Kaidazan powder and dissolving it in vinegar. Um, and then it becomes this like very, very viscous solution overnight um, and then pouring it into a Petri dish uh, and letting it dry for, it should be, if you don't put it in front of a fan, it's gonna be like a week, but it's really magical to just see that whole process unfold. And um, I am still working on this. And so it's all very new to me as well, but uh, it's it's been really, exciting and amazing to see the cicadas and how their shells are still around on the ground and their bodies are gone. And that's also because um, the bacteria that break down their shells is much more uh, rare than the bacteria that break down the cicada bodies. So it's like chitin is a material that can kind of situate itself. It is compostable, but it will also like outlive certain timelines that other materials that are water soluble won't. Um, so yeah, I'm still working on this. It is, uh, if you want to ask more questions about it, I will do my best to answer, but, um, yeah, this is, this is what I know about it so far. So I think, yes, I have some more slides I can show. Um, so here's some, uh, unless you have questions. Yeah, some questions. Uh, anyone have any questions? This is really fascinating. Thank you. I can't believe what you've done. Thank you. How? Yeah, it's been very strange and exciting. 
How long do these processes take? Like when you make the powder and I mean, is it days or weeks or? Um, so the powder, I buy the powder commercially because I haven't undergone this entire process yet. I've gotten up to this part. So to step four, um, it, it probably would, it's really just, you would want to put it in the bath from the papers that I've read um, anywhere from like two hours to like 24 hours. So it probably wouldn't take more than a week, but you need the right equipment. And um, if if anyone is in Baltimore, uh, one of the spaces that was really helpful uh, with this process is called Baltimore Underground Science Space. Uh, they are awesome. They are a um, community science lab. So they have like classes where you can take, um, you can learn about just like biology, chemistry, um, genetic engineering, and it's open for anyone. And it was really important for me because it was a space where I was able to um, learn about science and I felt like it was for me again. Okay. Um, but yeah. Oh, great. We got to We should post that. that and does anyone else have any questions? This is just fascinating what you're doing. I just think it's incredible. Thank you. Anyone out there? Really incredible. I think you've done a wonderful job. And I know with certain materials like resins and the fiberglass, you really have to be careful. My husband's a sculptor. He graduated from Reinhardt. He taught at Morgan for 42 years. And there were things that happened with chem just natural materials that you have to really be careful with. And we're still learning that he just had his 80th birthday and we're still learning so you're young and starting this and i wish you the best time thank yeah. you that's great to hear that he went to reinhardt and he's a sculptor yes yeah yep <laughs> yeah it's definitely interesting learning about the ways some bodies are more sensitive to some materials than others um exactly. and yeah it's yeah, I don't know exactly why, but um, I think it would have to do with the amount that we sanitize things. Yeah. yeah. I have a question. Uh, thanks so much, Sasha. This is just so cool and innovative. And I love that you're working at solving the problem of waste and toxicity and art materials. Um, I know that this is a talk about these processes, but I'm wondering if you could talk about how your research, besides the materials, um, how it informs your art practice, your sculpture practice? Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. Okay. It, so a lot of the, the things I've been thinking about are kind of like um, our desire to control entropy and resin does exactly those things. Um, and through through working with it, I was kind of just like making this all these things that are going to outlive me. And through also through learning about the actual like molecular components of it, the chemistry of it, and um, where it comes from and where it goes uh, when it's thrown away, um, I began to kind of my picture of like what this material is, the kind of vitality around it began to expand to like water systems because a lot of plastics are ending up into the ocean um, and also circulating into fish and back into us. And it, um, the science of it has been really interesting because it kind of feeds into my um, kind of impulses to want to like organize things and to um, have like a rigid answer about why this thing does what it does, but also um, through sculpting, it kind of allows me to understand it and kind of um, better bridge those questions together that can't exactly answer it in a straightforward way. Um, so like, for example, um, one of the, I've been thinking a lot about um, water and fluid materials that are kind of um, like the, I'm totally blanking on it, the materials in the show right now. 
Uranium glass. Okay, yes. Um, radioactive materials that. Okay. Cool. Have you read Hyperobjects, Elizabeth? Yes. Okay. So, um, when I read Hi Hyperobjects, is a, a a book by Timothy Morton, which is kind of about these um, phenomenons that are larger than us that we can't see all the time, but we can only kind of see when they line up with um, something that we can observe. So like uh, the other day, there was all the smoke um, from the fires in California that had come all the way to the East Coast. And to me, that was like um, a hyper object, like that material in the sky that was kind of like this like film and also a pollutant in the air that we caused us to not be able to go outside if you're sensitive to it. Um, and those materials, the way that they interact with our bodies um, and the way that our bodies kind of, they pass through our bodies um, and go back into the earth or not has kind of informed my practice in um, the ways that like a radioactive material would begin to also, if it were to go through your body, it would begin to kind of cascade into other, you know, other molecules and into your bones. Um, it's like all of this, all of my interest has kind of like through materials has been informed through just like working with it. That's not the most straightforward answer, but. Um, I think you're really interested in the relationship of water and stable materials. Yes, the, I, mean, I guess what I'm trying to say is the, the rate at which materials decay has really informed um, the way that I think about it. Does that make sense? Definitely. I, I, I think that's a great answer because it's like there are so many threads that you're working towards and following. And, um, you know, it just seems like there's so much, it's such a rich area to mine. So I kind of appreciate your sort of web of an answer because it shows, you know, it demonstrates how much there is there. Thank you. Yeah. I feel like some days I have a better sense of being able to articulate it in a much more concise way. Today is a little, a little bit more difficult for some reason, but um, thank you for that question. It has been also, it, it's hard to talk about because it, is, it encompasses so much. We've got so many systems. Sasha, what is the name of the book you mentioned, Elizabeth, that you both, both were saying about a book? Yeah, Hyper, Hyper Objects. Hyper Objects, H-Y-P. Uh, mm -hmm. By Timothy Morton. Timothy mm -hmm. Morton. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, he was very ahead of his time. He wrote it in like 2014 and it's also about like climate change and um, how it impacts our bodies. Good. Tasha, this is Dottie. I have a question about, first of all, you know how enthusiastic I am about the work that you're doing. When you're talking about natural dyes, have you delved into any of the um, historically ancient cultures like the Egyptians who, when you look at their artifacts, the colors to this day are still incredibly vibrant and they had nothing synthetic in those days. Mm. It was all what was there on the planet. Um, have you done any research along those lines? Mm -hmm. Yeah, like it, I assume you're talking about like Egyptian paste, like the really bright blue, vibrant blue ceramic pieces. And all the all the colors, all the primary the colors, colors, the reds yeah, and the so yellows, and okay. just the, yeah, a lot of I, those are are mineral based and toxic. and yes, and are toxic. <laughs> They're not the yeah. A lot of them are kind of toxic. Um, yeah, I I think the next area of materials I've been kind of moving towards is minerals and mining because it is like a very old practice and a lot of. Um, I've been reading a lot about how radioactive waste is like kind of the excess material that does come out of that extraction process. Um, and I think because when minerals are mined, it's kind of like a, um, a mosaic of all these other materials embedded into it. Um, it's hard to kind of avoid those other materials like heavy metals. So, um, but yeah, I have, I've been, there's a book called, I think it's the history of the color red or something like that, but it's about, um, it's been talking about like 
the ways that red was first used in like um, the textile industry in Venice um, and all the different sources of it. So like um, a cochineal, um, what else? There's like some kind of um, another mineral. Oh, um, what's Gold. this toxic? I'm totally forgetting. Gold and bomb. Yeah, cadmium. Yeah, it's the ones that are very vibrant that stay around are usually mineral based that also have a whole range of um, it, toxins. But yeah, it, it's interesting. It's really fascinating. Fascinating, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Well, thank you, Sasha. This was really fascinating. Really fascinating. Thank you. And just one you more. Uh, okay. If anyone okay. is interested, you should check out Neri Oxman. She, um, was a professor at MIT. She has an episode on abstract and she was kind of the first, um, she's like an artist, architect, designer, scientist, engineer. She's incredible, uh, who's working with biomaterial. She had a show up at MoMA recently. She also actually works with Kaidazan that was made from these massive 3D printers. And she also works with like silkworms. Um, and her, her work is just kind of, um, at like the forefront of this um, movement that is in between art and science. Does she use your blue, the blue you found in the spirulina? Um, not, not that I know of. I, I believe she, from what I know, I think she reached out to them, the company that I was working with. So who knows, maybe one day we'll see it. But that blue is very special. If anyone is interested in a sample of it too, just reach out to me and I can put you in touch with them. Great. My husband keeps appearing in the background. <laughs> Great. Hi. <laughs> All righty. Well, thank you so much. I hope you stay in touch with us and, um, and we can have you back sometime. This is really exciting. Thank you. This has been awesome. I really appreciate you having me. And thank you everyone for coming. Thank you. It's okay. so cool that your name is Fishman. Yeah, <laughs> right, it worked out. Oh my God. <laughs> Love it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Okay. Thank you. And thank you for the questions. Night, night. <laughs> Thanks.